take it from me, from the perspective of someone in government, that this government is much more than bothered and there's so much, a whole lot is being done, including the deliberate palliatives. The poor cannot sleep because the poor is hungry, right? The rich will not sleep, but the poor is awake. As the Commissioner for Finance of this state, Oh, you're talking about once, 2013. I was arrested by the EFCC, detained by the EFCC five numbers, five times. ICPC three times. But the major challenge, if you probably don't know, that brought us where we are, is not that the farmers are not willing or they're not farming, but the farmlands are not safe, especially in the north. I did banking for 13 years. I was appointed commissioner for finance of the United States. I'm a current serving member of the House of Representatives. And the last time I checked, I built over 32 health centers across my constituency. The amount you mentioned, one billion. So I didn't know what was the contract sum, another, and another. So we followed due process. The problem, the governor called me. I'm talking about his excellence, well and I just a common chat. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, my name is uh, Nam Fosnwala and I'm the chief host of Feeding Park. Um, today we have um, our guest in the studio, Honorable Ikon Chike Okako. We believe that's a name that is renowned and known. So today we are a bit deviating from the things that we used to do. This segment is different. Um, I termed this segment um, the scoreboard for politicians uh, and what they do outside politics, things that they have done to be who they are, their lifestyle, their personality, and um, their mannerisms. And we have here Chiki the co host. And um, we're going to be going straight to our introductions. And, um, sir, please, Matt, um, introduce yourself. Thank you so much, Simon, for having me. Um, this is my first time here, and um, I want to believe that um, it will be worth a while. I hope I can indeed uh, introduce me. My name is uh, Chiki John Okafo. And um, you said you don't want to talk about politics, but I think I, I, the introduction wouldn't be complete if I don't tell you Definitely. that Definitely. I'm a current serving member of the House of Representatives of this country, representing the good people of a he member, no, he too, Obama, who the federal constituency of Ibo State. And currently, I'm the chairman of the House Committee on Nutrition and Food Security. Okay. I don't know whether that tells you who I am. Okay, definitely. Okay. Mm. Okay. Um, first of all, I would like to delve a little bit into your personal life, your family life. Your. Can you give us a little bit of insight? Okay. So, um, personal life, family life. I was born immediately after the Nigerian Civil War to. Now, His Royal Highness is a Ifa Echuku John Okafo, and um, that's my father. Mm -hmm. And my mother, Ugo, is a Victoria Adako Okafo. I come from, it used to be a sleepy town, Umo Yocha, in Umo Oke, autonomous community of Obo, local government area. I, I started my primary school in the village, so I usually tell people that I'm a village boy. I attended community primary school, Umu Oke. After then, I, because in those years, when growing up in the 80s, you hardly have, um, we didn't quite have what, what you call today as private schools. And then the more of the public schools who had then, government-owned schools who had then, where they had these incessant strikes, mm -hmm. you know, so you weren't quite getting regular quality education. So 
the alternative then was to go to the mission schools. So my father considered or thought of sending me to a mission school. So I started my higher education from then St. Peter's Seminary mm -hmm. in Hidu, Burma, okay. today known as St. Uh, Thomas Aquinas mm -hmm. um, Seminary in Hidu, Burma. Mm -hmm. um, but because the whole idea was not for me to become a priest, somewhere along the line, you know what they say, I don't know whether it's in the Bible, say, many are called, few are chosen. So somewhere along the line, I left, I had to leave the seminary, and I came to a wedding where my parents were living and still living now, and finished from the prestigious Holy Ghost College already. Okay. After then, I gained admission to the Imo State University, which is still here in Owere, in 1992, 93 academic session. Uh, we happened to be the first set, the pioneer set that started that university in Owere after the creation of Abia. So the then Imo State University was taken over by Abia State. So the then government of uh, His Excellency Ivan Ewarem of uh, blessed memory had to how to relocate Imo State University to where it is today at Lake Webber campus. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was part of the first set, nuclear set, mm -hmm. that started that university. And then I, I started economics and then graduated in 1997, mm -hmm. went to do my national youth service uh, in the present Ocean State one year. And then immediately after national youth service, I started my career in banking. I used to pride myself as one of the few Nigerians who who didn't, who didn't know what it was like to be in the labor market. Mm -hmm. So from the university, made after national youth service, barely one month of national youth service, I started my, my, my career in banking. I worked with then All States Trust Bank. Then I had some good mobility in banking. So I moved from All States to Oceanic Bank and then to Zenit Bank. I'm sure you know the Zenit Bank here on Wedra Road, the one that looks at the stadium. Mm -hmm. So that's where I actually you know, started with Zenit Bank and um, rose to the very high level, management level. Um, the Zenit Bank you have on Bank Road, opposite Government House, I was a pioneer manager. Mm -hmm. I built that structure and started that structure, that, that branch, until sometime in June 2011, when immediately after the elections that produced uh, Governor Rocha Zogorocha, mm -hmm. I was appointed Commissioner for Finance of Imo State, mm -hmm. a position I held for the entire duration of his first term that terminated in 2015. So somewhere along the line, shortly before the general elections in 2015, I was I was encouraged, I was motivated, I was advised to run for National Assembly. So in 2015, I ran an election to National Assembly House of Representatives and um, I've been there since then to today. So uh, family life, I'm married to the most wonderful woman here on earth, the Kinesa Kudo Kafo, who is the proprietress of um, Mountain Crest International Schools. Okay. Yeah, you know where they And uh, we are blessed with three wonderful children, a daughter who will soon turn 19, and then a son who was soon 17, another one turning 15. And um, the first two are undergraduates. May I ask a little bit? How do you combine what you are to family life? Well, life is about choices. You must strike a balance. You must make up your mind what you want to do. Okay. I don't think there is any combination of responsibilities that you want to do that you would find adequate time to grapple with. So. I said that to say that life is about choices mm -hmm. and then also prioritizing. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you become a jack of all trades and master of none. Okay. So for so someone like me who enjoyed a home, mm -hmm. I come from what you call an average Nigerian home. Okay. Both parents were civil servants, though now retired. Okay. And we were six in number. And um, I, I, I saw love. I felt love, I was shown love. So family values were inculcated in me. So when I I was getting married at the age of 30, 31, there about, I didn't have, there was nothing I needed to know about life, work, balance that I, I mean, I, I needed to know that I didn't, I didn't know. So um, yeah, banking, political life, 
public office, these things are coming later. Okay. Or they, they came after the family. Okay. So, like I said, I want to repeat, life is about choices. Mm -hmm. You make your choices. Mm -hmm. And then life is about also prioritizing. If you make your family a priority, mm -hmm. you will always find time okay. to give adequate time because you cannot substitute the place of a father in a home. The same way you cannot substitute the place of a mother in a home. Okay. That's what God made it to be a man and a woman. Mm -hmm. That's why when you see a child from or from a single parent mother, mm -hmm. say to say, mm -hmm. you if you get close to him or her, you will also see mm -hmm. that there's a vacuum that was never filled. Okay. The same is also the same also with um, a child who probably grew up with a single father. Okay. So uh, I said that to say that both parents have a responsibility, have a role to play in the entire family. You can't just oppose this upon the other one. Mm -hmm. So uh, having that good understanding, I'll give you an example. From the moment I went to National Assembly in 2015 to today, how many years after, my family stayed still living here in Uwere. So I go to Abuja to work. I come back to Uwere, to family. So what I have in Abuja is um, a little accommodation. Mm -hmm. So all I do there is stay there and go to work as a National Assembly member. Then every Friday, I'm on the next available flight. Every Friday. Every Friday. I can count how many weekends I had spent in Abuja. Well, for the, for the reason that my family is here, and also I'm very much involved in my local church here. Okay. I'm an ordained minister in my church. I have responsibility in the church here, you mm -hmm. know, where it is. So, and uh, we're not talking religion here, we're not talking church, but yeah, if we'll, you're we'll still get to that. the same <laughs> way, the same way you, mm -hmm. you cannot, you can't substitute the role of a father or the mother in a home. It's also the same way if you're a Christian and you find yourself in a local church mm -hmm. and you take up responsibility mm -hmm. and then you have to make yourself indispensable. So, mm -hmm. so much so that no one can do what you do. Okay. So that means you'll always have to be available to play your role. So when you talk about how do I balance work with home, I said that to say that to add also that I have a responsibility in the kingdom, in my local church. So it's my responsibility to prioritize them make out time for them and make sure that I satisfy all the responsibilities and that brings fulfillment to mm -hmm. me. You know, um, we understand that the public always have opinion about, you know, towards every politician. And uh, as, much, as much as we're not talking much about politics, we would also want to know what aspect of your life is constant uh, that is actually facts that people do not know. Well, I think my, my life is um, like a mirror. It's out there. I don't have any private... Uh, there's nothing about me that I can tell you that nobody in around that knows me know or don't know. Because I try to live a transparent life. Okay. To answer your question directly, politics ought not to change who you are. The same way you are into media, and publicity, mm -hmm. does that change who Nam the policy Wala is? Mm -hmm. it, it shouldn't change who you. So it's about, I mean, make a choice of profession or a choice of vocation. Mm -hmm. That should not change the person that mm -hmm. you are. The person that you are is a function of um, some can say genetics, okay. your, you know, the makeup, and then your training, the things that have influenced you. I mean, academics, mm -hmm. you know. These are the things that make up who you are. But when you now find yourself in an environment where you have to do, like in your own case, this is what you're doing. Anybody who knows you out there will come in here and see you and still see Namde. Mm -hmm. Anybody who knows you here will also come out there and see you and say, that's the same Namde. So you, except one has, um, you know, people who live a queer life, mm -hmm. that's where you probably have this confusion in people's head. Whether you find yourself in politics, that's what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. Politics is a vocation. Some people also make it a profession. But it does not change who you are. That's why whether you were a lecturer in the classroom and probably find yourself holding political office, either elective or mm -hmm. appointive, the student that you taught in school mm -hmm. runs into you in the public space, mm -hmm. I mean, where you're holding political office. He doesn't see a different man mm -hmm. in that political space from the man that he or she used to see or know in the classroom. 
the same way if you're a pastor in a church mm. and you find yourself, let's use, let's use Pastor Tunde Bakare as an example. Okay. The Tunde Bakare that you see in Lettering Church, okay. you know, screaming and preaching from the pulpit. Mm -hmm. When he was vice presidential candidate, he was a running mate to, to Buhari. I didn't see a different Tunde Bakare whilst they were campaigning to the Tunde Bakare that I knew and I, 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 was, I got used to listening to, you know, his messages and all that. So what means, what, what, what changes is that this is not Tunde Bakare who is preaching from the pulpit. All right? This is not Tunde Bakare who is standing beside or standing on the on the campaign box talking to Nigerians about why he wants to be the vice president of the country. Mm -hmm. But the Tunde Bakare that is standing there is the same Tunde Bakare. What has, what, what has happened is that and it has changed environment. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't change who he is. Mm -hmm. So my point is, whether you are in politics, People who knew me, I did banking for 13 years. Mm. So people who knew me while I was rising through the ranks and became a manager, management, senior management staff of Zenith Bank, and then now I see me outside the banking hall, can tell you that nothing changed about Chike. But what, ha what changed is that Chike has changed location. Chike has changed the environment. No longer in banking environment, but now in the political space. When you see me in church, singing because I'm, I'm a gospel gospel, gospel musician mm -hmm. when, when i'm singing you're seeing the banker the federal house member who is singing mm -hmm. it doesn't change who you are what changes is the environment where you find yourself so you you transport the totality of your personality mm -hmm. to any assignment or responsibility or environment you find yourself you don't i don't know how to put it you don't have to make it complicated for the public Okay. to see through. I, I would like to... You want to say yes, something? yes. So, um, Honorable, I want to know, would you say that based on your you becoming a politician or based on your empowerment that people are doing well today through you because of... Yes, I will say that. I will say that. Okay. I will say that. Um, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me give you this scenario. And then we also still talking about what makes you who you are. As a young chap, my parents were, were living in a way that my parents were civil servants. That's something we say in Igbo, and I, I don't know if um, you will understand it. That's, that talks about influence. Now, as a little child, my mother will never go home for Christmas without an additional bag of rice. Okay? I, I'm trying to answer your question. Okay. My mother will never go home. So when she's buying stuffs for us to go home for Christmas, I see her carrying two, three bags of rice. But we'll, if the family will end up eating only one bag. I'm not even finishing it. So mainly my mother gets to the house, she brings out the bags of rice, then takes one to her kitchen and then brings out the other two or one depending on how much you know the more she's out she was able to afford and then she will call the women in the immediate immediate kindred and have them share that bag of rice i was watching as a child right as she grew in public service with her husband i saw them buy three bags four bags so so that so that a lot more people can get mm -hmm. right when i started working in 1998 as mm -hmm. a banker I got home some weeks before Christmas. I was I started my banking career in Port Harcourt. My mom said to me, "Na, you have such a full rice or lay bag, bag bag of rice or lay." Mom said, "Mommy, it's your lay." And I got like eighty four at Christmas. I said, "Mommy, okay, I'll see what I can do." I I came back with three packs of rice. She already had two. So what happened? She took six packs of rice. To the village we were all able to eat only one okay. the rest she shared it to the immediate you know right. women are, families around her so as i was rising you know and then probably becoming a lot more economically you know um uh comfortable i saw her liking the idea of buying for 10 bucks 20 bucks when i got married in 2003 i was still a very junior banker it was now my my mother telling the women that it's the chicken's wife that brought this rice. I don't mm -hmm. even know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So that became a regular feature in our home. 
So as I was also rising, and then I was also getting a lot more empowered, we were no longer doing 10 bucks, 20 bucks. Now, when I found myself holding political office, and I dare say, forget those who tell you otherwise, political office holding brings some more little empowerment to you. Now, but you begin to ask yourself, it is that empowerment, if you have a mind of Christ, if you are naturally a giver, you will see that office. I'm trying to answer your question. Now, you see that, that office as an opportunity to do a lot more. But if you don't have that DNA in you, you would see it otherwise. So for me, I, I discovered that the reason for holding political office is to do much more. So while I was no longer buying 20 bars, 30 bars, I will now buy trailer load. I don't know if I'm saying. Yes. So, so that you can now give to as many people as possible. Yes, so holding political office, the whole idea is to make the lives of people around you better. Let me use this right word to make to better the lives of your constituents. You know, because immediately you find yourself in political office, whether you are a councillor in the local government area, you have a constituency, mm -hmm. your immediate constituency. So when you probably become member house of assembly, the entire local government area, in our own case, in Nigeria, in Imo, mm -hmm. is your constituency. Now, for me, who is in National Assembly Federal House of Representatives, I have three local government areas. The member, no, you two bomber, Opo. So that is my constituency. So yes, you hold political office, the whole idea is to make sure that the lots, the lives of the constituents are better. If you're doing otherwise, then it's a disservice to the people. Okay. I don't know if I answered you. Yes, you did. I want you to throw more light based on just what you talked about, about the medical outreach. Oh, okay. You, we, we understand that um, you have done lots of medical outreach in your place. Uh, what's the intent and... Can you throw more light? Okay, let, let, let me say this for the first time in, a, in an interview, in an open interview. I didn't just wake up and I decided or I chose to start that outreach. When I got to National Assembly and we got inaugurated on the 9th of June, 2015, a couple of weeks down the line, the leadership of uh, the House of Representatives, then led by Speaker Yakubu Dogara, set up what we call House Standing Committees. And me, who had nothing to do with health. Of course, I told you I studied economics. I studied banking and finance, economics, banking and finance, up to PhD level. So all I have done in my life is financial engineering. All I've done in my life is um, money, economy, economics. So I found myself being appointed chairman of the House of Reps Committee on Health Care Services. Now, because I had already formed you know my values my ideas to the extent that i believe that any place any time i find myself in any environment any responsibility god has a reason for it okay so maybe i was desiring to be chairman committee on finance maybe i was desiring to be chairman committee on appropriation or committee on banking banking and currency i mean talking about where i was coming from but god in his uh, wisdom put me in committee on healthcare services so while I was oversighting the agencies, Minister of Health, health institutions like Federal Medical Centers, uh, NAVDAC, National Primary Health Care, National Health Insurance and all that, while I was oversighting them, I found out that they could help me. I found out that the only thing they can do for me is to impact on the health of my people. They will not give me money, but they can help me set up health centers. And the last time I checked, I built over 32 health centers across my constituency. And if you probably also add up those ones I had to do for my friends across Imo State, I did over 57 primary health care centers in this state. And From got, the scratch. Yes, and got them equipped. Mm. And then some we did renovations across the state, including over the West, where we are. Okay, so what am I trying to say? The medical outreach was a child of necessity. I discovered that I can have that done with little or nothing. Another twist to it was that because I was also oversighting those agencies, when they were doing employment, it was easy for me to nominate one or two or three people who studied medicine and medical related courses and got them employment. So when I conceived the idea or when the idea was given to me that you can do outreach every year, 
the agency says we will bring money, we will support you. Those people that I was able to put in those agencies, medical doctors, nurses, and others, said we will donate our time, do we will donate our ex expertise. That's how this medical artery started. So it has run, this is the eighth year, the one we are just concluding now is the eighth year. And I discovered that, of course, health is wealth. So we started in 2017, if I'm not mistaken, we do not just medical outreach. We do what we call comprehensive medical stroke surgical outreach. So what that means is that people come to designated health centers across the three local government areas and doctors do, you know, medical examinations and all that and all that. They will now discover or identify those who need surgery. And then they will now select particular days for surgery. When we started in 2017, we did about 41 surgeries. I'm talking about including fibroid, including goister. The records are there. And then the one we just concluded now, they did uh, 112 surgeries. And remarkably, we have not lost any life since mm. we started. Mm. That means it's divinely orchestrated. Mm. So yeah, the medical outreach thing for me, two things, one, what I do in education and then the medical outreach. These are two fundamental things that people need mm -hmm. currently. Mm -hmm. Give them health, give them education. So that has come to stay. To the extent that I have told myself, even if I find myself out of political office, God, give me resources. I want to sustain that. People need it. People are sick. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw some videos and pictures flying around about each time I go to the centers. Mm -hmm. You will see that you are giving life and succor mm -hmm. to people. The last time, two weeks ago, I went to Dr. Mazetike Memorial Hospital, one of our centers in Obo, and I saw women. That was a particular one I interviewed. She said, I've carried this fibroid for four years. The last time she tried to do it, the husband had to sell a piece of land for 150,000 naira, and then they were asking for 400,000 naira. They didn't have it. I said, well, now you've done it. How much did you pay? She said, Mm -hmm. So such things gave me satisfaction. I mean, you are bringing life. There was a particular lady two years ago who was introduced to me by one major clergy in my constituency. She was taken for death. She had, she had, um, it's not, it's not um, fibroid. I don't know what they call it. Her, her, her tummy was as big as this. You probably would think she was carrying um, two or three kids. No, she wasn't pregnant. It was death knocking. A team of doctors led by Professor Eke Ejikem for nine hours, but bottled, and that lady today is alive. So um, that's the idea, my brother. The medical artery thing has come to stay. Even when I find myself out of political office, I know that the God I serve will give me resources to now fund it. I thank God also there are foundations all around who also are going to be willing because we have been able to carve a niche and then make an impact. So when we reach them, to come and support us, I know they will, because my people definitely will not want to see that outreach die. So, um, Honorable, I have a question. Um, this um, medical movement, this outreach, is it out of benevolence or it's just political? Uh, it's, it can be anything but political. It's not political. Um, I think I'd rather say it, it's a, it's, it came as, it, it, out of necessity. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not out of, out of benevolence. Okay. That means out of sympathy. No, it is not an uh, act of politics. No, uh, completely put, better put, it's out of necessity. I don't know where you come from, but if you come to the part of Imo where I come from, you would uh, understand that People need to be healthy and people need to eat. So I saw that as, um, as a very big necessity and um, it's been feeling a void and I'm happy about it. You know, when you come out and people call you a word and an ego, you know, so it confers some level of satisfaction and mm -hmm. fulfillment in me. So it is not politics. It is not basically out of benevolence. I think my, my people need it and I'm getting the results, and I'm getting the um, the accolades. You know, I'm a politician. Okay. We also like accolades. Mm. So I'm getting that. Yeah, 
I'm getting that. So we are sustaining it and I'm very happy about it. One of the greatest joys I have, the greatest joy I have is when somebody tells me, my wife is alive because of you. Okay. My mother didn't have to die because of you. Mm-hmm. My father didn't have to die because of you. Mm. Let, me, let me share this experience. Sometime in 2017, we did the outreach and then we used one health center in a, a market called Oriago. Okay. In no more cargo. That's yes. around your visit. Yes. Yes. We used it. I didn't even go. I didn't even know. Mm. So mm. outreach had been concluded. One year down the line, we went for campaign for Senate. It wasn't my own election. Okay. We went for campaign for Senate. And I was in the entourage of the senatorial candidate. A woman ran out. A very pretty woman ran out, carrying a child. And then protocol and security wanted to stop us. He said, no, leave it happen. Happen. The quick chick cooker for your mom. So people, my friends started laughing, as in like, did you get a woman pregnant here? Of course, that is. <laughs> so I said, well, of course, you know, it's not what I can do. So let's hear her out. She said, Eminem operation when you when you brana or my cargo hair center. She did surgery. She did fibroid. She was married for four years before then without a child. Then the surgery was was conclu- concluded that it was successful. And between that time and when we were talking, she had already gotten Consumed. pregnant and had a child. The child was barely two months old, but because she had, we were coming and I was, she was, she was in her home and then we called her Chike Sobia, Chike Sobia. She ran out. From that day, 2017 or thereabout, I vowed that I would stop the outreach. I went to Umwezala Health Center. Mm-hmm. I was coming back and then my handlers called me and said, political handler called me and said, two women gave birth in your outreach. They were not registered there because it was not a health center, but they were, they came within the period and they gave birth. That the nurses were now insisting that they must be paid a little money. I said, leave the women. The next day I flew from Abuja, I came there. I paid. For the sole purpose of that? Yes, I came. Two women. Mm-hmm. I said, let me not just have the, to hear that, oh, someone had fibroids, someone had appendicitis. It's a good news that somebody gave birth in my artery center. And then by the time I said Jack, one man, one guy rushed in and said, I named him Chike. I named him Chike. How, 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 much, how, much, how much joy can you have? I went to another, after some years later, I went to another outreach at the Titi Medical Center. A woman showed up with three plates. She had fibroid surgery in one of our centers in Obo. And then she's been following me around and about. She never mm-hmm. had a chance. Mm-hmm. On that day, she had a chance and brought the three boys. She named one John. That's my, my English name. Named one Chike. Named one Ifahim, my father's name. Three boys. So it is not out of benevolence. It came as a child of necessity. And I'm seeing the result. Like I said, it's fulfilling. I'm not going to stop. Let's um, um, deviate a bit uh, from that. Not really much deviation but uh, about um, your school we understand that you own a school may I ask do your children attend that school of course my, my daughter my, my daughter who is in the university is a pioneer is a pioneer uh, pupil from mountain crest mountain crest was um, started in 2012 mm. 2012 I think they just did 2013, they just did uh, 10 years. Before then, um, I, let, let me tell you how my, that school started. My wife, I married her, and she just finished uh, graduation from the university in Umudike. Mm-hmm. That's where she graduated from. When when we got married, I met her while she was in her final year, and then we got married as she was about going for national youth service. Then I was working in the bank in Oceanic, and just as a young banker, you know, I wasn't poor, but I wasn't very rich. You know, I just got married, living in a two room, and then got married to a young woman, prettier than than you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that that was on a lighter note. I hope you don't mind. So, got married, and then I was looking for what to do for my wife. I mean, I I, I wasn't going to have a hundred percent house house housewife, but I also wasn't going to have her work in a bank. 
Why? Even if I had a chance. Why? Okay, don't hang. Okay, don't hang. You know, I back in then you seven seven o'clock you're on your way out. Seven p.m. you're not back. Was that the only reason? Oh yes, for me. Well, well I think uh, there are other reasons why people don't want their wife to work in the. That's bank. them. I am me. My reason, my reason was banking was and still engaging. Yes. So I can't have a wife who probably mm -hmm. also as i'm rushing out in the morning she's rushing out okay and then we are coming back late what happens to the children okay so okay so over the period mm -hmm. i also didn't want her to get a paid job i felt i had i had a woman who was also looking resourceful mm -hmm. and so i tell you this story two years after our wedding okay three years we went to england i took all my life savings in pounds and asked her to go shopping. She went to some markets, as I want to call Liverpool market in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. She bought shoes, very beautiful shoes, like the one uh, Miss Chike is wearing. <laughs> she bought shoes, she bought bags. Okay. I can remember, if I'm not mistaken, that was 2006. Okay. I gave her 4,000 4, pounds to buy things and come back and sell. We got back. For me, and I was waiting for her to return my capital. Mm. Mm? Well, I like business. Mm -hmm. One week, two weeks, I look in the room, the stock of shoes and uh, uh, bags were depleting. Obviously, the monies are going into her account. So I thought. So more down the line, another 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 holiday, we were, we we're going to travel. And I, I was asking her, so bring the money you sold mm -hmm. so we can now use the money and go on. I said, Daddy, uh, I said, what happened? He said, they've not paid, and some have not paid. And now she now confided in me. I gave Pastor this, this. I gave Pastor this. I gave, she has given out the things. Oh, well, yeah, so see it. <laughs> so, so I did it again the second time, and I discovered that this woman is not cut out for trading. Mm -hmm. That's also the mistake people make. In relationships, mm -hmm. in marriage, mm -hmm. you force, you force things, things on people without mm -hmm. trying to know what what drives them, what's their passion. I forgot that while I was cutting this lady, as a Christian, then she was heading knife face in her school and in the sub zone. When I when I go to Mudike, they will tell me, oh, she's in the chapel. I will mm -hmm. go to chapel. She is not inside the church. She is in the children. She was a children church, a children's uh, department department teacher. So that means this woman grew up to know or to like kids. Mm -hmm. So until about that period, one day she woke up and said, Daddy, mm -hmm. that property you have there, I want to start a school there. I said, you know what it means to start a school? I didn't know that this woman had already gone to Ministry of Education and registered the school, registered the name. My, we have a family business called uh, Mountain Top, you know, and all that. Mm -hmm. and so she coined Mountain Crest out of my family business name. This is without you knowing about it. She didn't tell me, but she had started because I was busy then. I was coming for finance. But when she needed to start up, she now told me. Okay. And I looked at it. It wasn't a bad idea. I said, okay, fine. Now I see something I think you want to do. Mm -hmm. And sincerely, as she started, my daughter was already enrolled in one school. I don't want to mention the name. Mm -hmm. She was already in a class one or so, they are about, or, or nursery. So she started the school with seven kids or eight. Mm -hmm. Three of my children, two kids belonging to my friend, one the son of my younger brother, and two other kids. Okay. Eight. Today that school is over a thousand three hundred. Okay. Yes. So that's how Mountain Crest came about. So Mountain Crest is an entirely vision that my wife, you know, conceived and is driving. That's why if you go there, they will tell you Mountain Crest is not just a school; it's a vision. It's God's vision. And I'll tell you this. If you know that there are schools that are owned by churches, right? Mm -hmm. I, I mentioned the seminary. Anglican have their mm -hmm. own seminary. Mm -hmm. Methodists have schools. Mm -hmm. Just like you have um, Babcock mm -hmm. belongs to mm -hmm. Baptist. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Mountain Crest is not just a Christian school. It's a Pentecostal school. Okay. So if you don't want your child to be schooled in the Pentecostal way, don't bring your child. Because if you bring your child, mm -hmm. the child will be forced to speak in tongues. <laughs> Okay. So that's the idea of Mountain Crest. Okay. Um, we understand that. Um, I don't know if I've said due to poverty or hunger or the fact that most families cannot take care of their kids. Uh, the rise in illiteracy is becoming much. 
what have you done in that regards to alleviate you know people from being what what impact have you met in the educational okay. sector okay. aside the fact that you own a school no Mat in, Mat in Mat is not um, a foundation okay the school yes. it's a pure business my wife is running okay and that's why somebody will tell you that it's the most expensive school here mm. but that's it the quality is high the curriculum is british so but to answer your question directly mm. while i was in the bank i took it upon myself when i became a little bit a lot more comfortable i can help Every kid from my immediate kindred in, in Umoke who was going to write jam, write waik, I was paid. Quite a, quite a number of them that were in the university, I was seeing them through. But in the last, since 2012, mm. this one is some other program or project that excites my spirit. Mm -hmm. In my ward, where I come from, Okinawa ward, I have three autonomous communities. Okay. We have one school. If you are who has traveled from Oweri to Omoha in the last one month? Has anybody traveled from Oweri straight to Omoha to Rumbise in the last one month or two? Mm -hmm. Okay, two, if you two, two months, maybe two months. You know my village. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Merely you cross the local government headquarters. Okay. Just look, look on your right. The most beautiful school you see along the road is called Okena Lagos Secondary Technical mm -hmm. um, School. It's the only only school in my ward, owned by the, community, the three communities in my ward, Umu Oke, Umu Logo, and then Umu Ago. Mm. Between 2012 and today, any child that passed through that school will tell you that I paid for his Waiyek or her Okay. Between 2012, okay. this is the 12th year. In fact, in January this year, it cost me 4 million naira to pay for the Waiyek. And then when I found myself for the political office, I don't. I work, I had to now also take it beyond my my immediate uh, world. I pick indigent kids from the communities. I go through the traditional institution, and go to the president generals of communities, mm -hmm. and they will identify very indigent mm -hmm. little children mm -hmm. who ordinarily will not be able to pay for work. Mm -hmm. And then I pay for the work for them, and then we we'll pick the best of them and pay for jam for them, mm. and then pick the best from them that are the most indigent, mm -hmm. and then they are in my foundation, I pay for mm -hmm. their university education. Because I think the greatest and the highest challenge you have in this world today is ignorance. Ignorance. And nothing cures it like education enlightenment. Mm. So that we are doing, and sincerely, it's when, you, when people say, it is difficult for Chico Kafo to be defeated in election in mm. his immediate local government area. This is the reason. People, the impact is enormous. Okay. Let me end no. that. Let me end this particular question okay. with this incident. Okay. Some three years ago, we went for campaign for Senate for after the death and burial of uh, Senator Ben Wadwogo of the Blessed Memory. Okay. Uh, Senator Frankie Bezim, that mm -hmm. you, ha you know today, yeah. when we were doing the campaigns for the election that produced him, Mm -hmm. He came to campaign in my community, and then I went with friends. I came, I flew from Abuja. I have, I had a particular friend. Incidentally, yesterday was his birthday, at an event in Nabugo, who came around mm -hmm. and then joined me in my entourage to that campaign mm -hmm. in Umulogo Field in my community. Mm -hmm. And then when we finished the rally, it was late in the evening, about six after six, and then we jumped into my vehicle and we were driving off. Mm -hmm. Say hi, he turned to me and said, "One minute, I have lost my glasses." It was a Calvin Klein. He said he bought it for $1,100. And then, of course, the medication, mm. the medicated part of it, cost about 450 So mm. total was almost 1700 He had lost it, maybe in the confusion and melee. So I stopped. I said, okay, you know what we're going to do? As we were going, I took my phone. I called my youth leader in that in my community. Mm. He answered me. I said, go around now, now. Get somebody with a, a vehicle, public address system, mm. drive around Umu Kanumu logo and announce that I lost my glasses. Mm. This is a true life story. I wasn't the owner of the glasses. I'm sure if some of those kids, some of those young men in my community will be watching this, they will say, oh, Onyushi deceived us. <laughs> so I said, pay 
Kasowa. That's the name of the man, mm -hmm. Kasowa. Kasowa has a vehicle, you know, mm -hmm. the two that run yeah, around the yeah, yeah. public address system. Mm -hmm. They run around now, now, before he gets late. Announce to the people that Chico Kafo lost his glasses in that rally. That was about 6 37 p.m. Mm -hmm. on the Friday night. Well, we'll go back to a wedding. Very early in the morning, I saw a text message from someone from the village mm -hmm. that has a news going around that you lost your glasses. I said, yes. He said some three kids, three young men showed up in his shop now mm. to say they found a glass. I said, okay, get the, get, get, get the glasses from them. They said, no, opportunity I'm going to go to we are Naka. That the chance they have to meet me one-on-one -on -one and shake my hand, that they won't give the glasses to him. So the guy called me back and said, this is what they said. I said, okay, know what you do? Are you busy in your shop? The guy that called me, I'm mm. supposed to have a shop. Mm. Incidentally, I set up a shop for him. No. I said, oh yeah, one one eighty. He says, sir, shh, close that shop. Put those guys in the next available vehicle. Bring them to my house in Owe. I took my phone. I called my friend. He was in a hotel. I said, star boy, can, can you come over to the house? Mm. He came. We were having breakfast. These people landed. I came outside. I saw them. I said, come. So you people stole my glass. So you should buy. I will just pick it. Then we had the announcement. We didn't know who was the owner, but what we had it was you. We now started running around to see you. I said, but one one lady said you push. I should you, I give it to him. You you, you, you refuse. So you say, how are we sure that I I yeah, go with Regia? They had to come. And I asked, and I called my friend. He came out. I said, is it the glass? So you show where it's my glass. I said, okay. And I asked them, why did you do this? The three of them on the road where I paid for them. I need to talk about mm. When they wrote Waiyek in Okinawa, was on the school. Mm. I paid for them. The other one said, "My mother is alive. No, you did have fibroid. As is alive, mm. how can we hear that it's your glass? And I will do anything, anything to it." Mm. So when you talk about impact, these are the reflections. These are the results. Mm. That announcement was made that it was my glass. Mm -hmm. They picked it. Ordinarily, you know what they were going to do? Fling it, sell it for fifty thousand naira. But that's why I said, let's make the announcement very early before something bad happens to the classes. Okay. So, my brother, you can't do, can't go wrong with acts of charity. You can't go wrong with acts of um, supporting and impacting lives. I'll tell you this, even if it doesn't resonate in your own time, your children will even live to benefit from it. And I will end with this. My father was a civil servant, retired as a permanent secretary. The while I found myself doing banking, I go to ministries and I ask for business. They say, oh, careful, you want your pay? I will tell them, my father, when he was a civil service, he helped my career. So what my father did while he was a civil service helped me in my career in banking. Mm -hmm. So and I believe strongly that what I'm doing today will help my children. So even if you are looking for um, that's what, what, what we say in my club, Rotary Club, you know, um, um, what you want to do, ask yourself, is it going to be beneficial to all concerned? If you're able to ask, answer that question, then do it. Even if you're not the beneficiary, someone else is going to benefit, and somehow God is not unrighteous, it will come back to you. Thank you. Uh, as you know, yes, was not regarding to this. It's, okay. okay. You mentioned um, earlier that you are in charge of food security. I'm the chairman of the House okay, of Health Committee on Nutrition and Food Security, yes. Okay. As it is now, there's hunger in the land. I mean, in Imo State, precisely. It's and, not in um, Imo State. Okay. Let me say generally. <laughs> yes. But I'm just saying, Imo State, um, people go to bed hungry and they wake up hungry. What are people doing about it? Are you? Is there a movement? Is there anything you're planning to do? Okay, let me ask. Let me let me answer this question this way. I the committee that I'm chairing was um, again another child of necessity. The the right honourable speaker of the House of Representatives Tenth Assembly, um, Speaker Abbas, had to saw the need. You know, because of the urgency, the hunger in the land, we may not have the time to go into the what we call the remote and immediate causes of um, why Nigeria is well, where we are with respect to poor nutrition and lack of food. But I can tell you from 
the, the legislative point of view and then my interface and interactions in the last couple of weeks we started you know running this committee with the relevant ministries departments and agencies of government like ministry of agriculture ministry of um, um, budget and planning and um, you know humanitarian affairs and the rest that this current government of his excellency um senator Bolame Tinubu is much much more worried you know than you can ever think about the current situation and what the government doing of course we have to encourage the farmers but the major challenge if you probably don't know that brought us to where we are is not that the farmers are not willing or they're not farming but the farmlands are not safe especially in the north so government have is trying to tackle the issues of insecurity because if you do not tackle the security issues the farmers will not move into the farm to farm and then also bring the produce to the next market unfortunately for us in the southeast in Igbo land and some part of south south we're going to be the, the worst heat because 80 percent of food you eat here come from there you see the yam you see the beans is it the tomato? Is it the pepper? Is it the onions? We go to buy them from the northeast and north central and then bring them here. But because of insurgency and insecurity, and those farmers are no longer going to the farm, they're not even having enough to even feed themselves, not to talk of bringing out to the next market somewhere in Makodi, Lafia, where, you know, where have you, before our people who now go to buy and buy and bring down here. So, but generally, like I said, this may not be the forum for us to look at the the multifarious, you know, uh, approaches that I am aware that the government is um, using to combat, you know, to to uh, to manage the situation. But take it from me, from the perspective of someone in government, that this government is much more than bothered, and uh, so much, a whole lot, is being done, including the deliberate palliatives. And interventions that government is doing. As I speak to you now, just three weeks ago, I took delivery of two truck load of rice. I was just delaying because I had to set up a committee, and then I looked at it. I said, "Okay, New Year is gone, Easter is around the corner. So between now and the end of the week and next week, we will bring out the whole rice. And I'm I'm also buying because the rice was given to us by federal government. Every the 360." Members of House of Reps and 109 senators were given this, um, you know, opportunity, you know, of taking food food home, because we are the people that are interfacing with the people as their representatives. So, federal government under 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 Tinubu had to now use the lawmakers as a channel to be able to get this food across, as you know, what we call um, palliative measures. It's not a permanent measure. So, in the, in the next uh, couple of days. I'll bring out my own and then my people will take them. But I actually was waiting. Government have given me, but I'm not waiting. I have arranged for, to use my own money. I have paid for beans, bags of beans, you know, to use to complement what we have. So please take it from me that this government is doing so much that we may not be able to discuss here to make sure that these challenges of food, it's, um, it's managed. And I'll tell you this, why we have to do it, especially the elites. Now they have to so go home. You're a big man. Do something. Let me tell you. I want you to take this home. The poor cannot sleep because the poor is hungry. Right? Mm -hmm. The rich will not sleep because the poor is awake. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have, as you know, this is, um, this place is called the Hidden Fat Podcast Studio. Yes. And uh, we, we, we tend to bring out what people do not know about our guests. Okay. Things that um, people would wonder. Does he do this? Or did, really? he, or did, he, do, did, you, uh, did uh, he do this? Or did he do this? Or can or, he do or, this? Or did this happen to him? So that being said, I would want to know what's the most difficult thing that you have ever faced as a married man with your wife? Hey! <laughs> the most difficult thing 
I've ever faced as a married man. <laughs> yes. I don't hmm. know. Can you give me an example? Yeah, I mean, like, I don't know anything. Like, uh, have your wife suspected you of anything or have any reason to suspect you? Or have you uh, have any reason to suspect your wife? Or, or you know, like, have she tried to reach out to you sometime and then you're not available and she attributed to something? Come on, you're a fine man. So definitely, there yeah, will definitely be something like that. So I'm what do you know? putting me on the spot. <laughs> every, every marriage has his own, uh, the other side of it. Mm. And uh, I'll tell you that no matter how successful anybody wants, you want me to believe that your marriage is. Mm. And if you're married for not less than five years. I don't even want to talk about 10, 20, 15, mm -hmm. I'll say five years. Mm -hmm. In fact, two years. Mm -hmm. And you have not had your dark sides. Mm -hmm. Then you're not being truthful. Definitely. You're not being honest. Mm. And um, not on my wife's side, because I am married to an angel. I don't know whether I can say this on, 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 on camera. Mm. I, I married a woman who at 24 years when I married her, never knew a man. Mm -hmm. And of course, she didn't know me because I mean we were Christians when we were when I met her, and then of course the the, the condition was spelled out that I have a covenant with my God. I, I'm talking about her, and not mm -hmm. me. I have a covenant with my God that I was not going to have anything to do with a man that is not my husband. And I said to her, "Okay, fine. So now I'm here, and we have agreed to marry. You feel break that covenant now? Make we start." See, you, you're not my husband yet. So I'm married to a woman who never knew a man, carnally, including me, until the wedding night. Oh, wow. October 18, 2003. So, and um, because of our discipline, because of our upbringing, and because of our, the spirit of God that she has. Well, you know so many, we get us our own day. Mm. Uh -huh. So, yeah, getting married to a young man who was very young and that shit, I was 31, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I had a bit of um, the other side of life mm -hmm. before getting born again. Mm -hmm. And of course, during courtship, I told her, me, I know there as you day. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I had this, I had that. Of course, somewhere along the line also, we had, she had a cousin of hers who was schooling in one of the schools, you know, where mm -hmm. who knew me back there who knew me <laughs> so when when the issue of um i'm, I'm, I'm getting married to chico car for chico the one that was in the shiny bank yes ha hmm. <laughs> you know women like that you know the way hmm. ha. so she tried to find out from her hmm. what was it hmm. ha. she didn't get it mm. guess where she will bring it to the next time i visited Definitely. are there things about you that you're not telling me i say i've told you everything now I'm not sure. Does this friend of mine, Mila mentioned your name. Mm -hmm. She said, hmm, ha, Chico Kafo, hmm, ha. I said, okay, does she stay in the way? Say yes. Is she a student? She said, yes. Mm -hmm. I mentioned yes, one or two schools. Yes, so I asked her, and she mentioned the school, and I had my fears. Mm -hmm. I said, baby, tell me now. She said, no, you should be talking. <laughs> I said, what should I say? Mm -hmm. Yes, I had a girlfriend in that school and I used to visit the place, but not anymore. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, the name, the name was mentioned to her. And mm -hmm. I was happy that the name that was mentioned to her was the wrong name. Okay. And of course, you know, a young woman who was as innocent, as naive, mm -hmm. she needed some validation. Okay. She needed to validate it. She needed some conviction. And I knew it because I was a, a little bit older than her. Okay. So you know what I did? I went The next time I was visiting her in school, I went to call the lady I know was a lady that her so-called friend, whom my little father was a cousin, was referring to. Mm -hmm. I went to her and said, Chiwe, you know that girl where I tell you, say, I want marry with the wedding. She said, I could do. You see, and I said, you haven't met her before? She said, yes. I said, yeah, why do you? She said, wait a minute. Somebody, somebody told her that I used to come to your school. And I guess mentioned your name. She laughed. She, wasn't a, she was a friend to a friend. Mm -hmm. In fact, she's eventually married to that guy. Okay. So I put her in the car and I drove from a wedding. If you know where Mudike is, I drove from Owele to Mudike with her. And as I got to the school, and then I sent for her, she came out. I said, meet Chiwe. They said, I said, and that was the name they mentioned to her. 
that was mm. someone I was doing mm. something with. Mm. She looked at me. She was said, I could come here. I've heard a lot about you. Chai came. Told me about you. Are oh, you a pretty woman? It was that day she not confessed mm. that she would not listen to anybody. That it was actually this mm. lady that they, they told her that I was my girlfriend. Okay, so that's it. Well, we got married. Oh yeah, one or two times she had had her suspicion. If a woman is in a marriage, married a young man, eh, mm. that can afford anything in life modestly, okay, and she doesn't think or she doesn't suspect him, that she doesn't love him. Mm. So that that. But what is important is that once marriage is built on trust mm. and confidence, why would you be talking about such a thing? I have a 19-year-old daughter. She's a big woman. Mm-hmm. So we've, we've, we've grown, you know, that that part and that stage of our mm-hmm. lives. We are now looking at old age. I'm in my 50s. Mm-hmm. She's in her f- late 40s. So what do we talk about? We don't, go, we don't grow past with your young men like you, Nandi. <laughs> feel they do now. Uh, that being said, what is, um, like I said, the public mm. always wants to know more. Okay, yes. And, um, this, and, and this is uh, uh, hidden facts. You want to know some hidden facts? Yeah. Ask more. So I'll what's, you. uh, what's your sexual relationship with your wife like? She's my wife. Very, very, very cordial. Very good. She's, she's, she's the sexiest woman in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when you catch her playing, <laughs> you probably, you probably, so, will, you probably so in the bedroom matters, everything is good. It's as good as I want it. <laughs> Not that she wanted. Oh, uh, it's as good as we want it. <laughs> okay, that didn't really come out well because you said as good as you wanted. It. <laughs> it's, as, it's as good as we both want it. Okay. We're young. We're young. I'm 51. She's 40. She wouldn't want to hear. She wouldn't want to. She wouldn't want to mention that. Oh no, yes, women don't she's like that. She's in her forties. She's in her forties. Yes. Okay. Mid forties. You think there will be room to have another child, or you're done with that? Okay. We actually, well, our last child is sixteen. Uh, Buka is sixteen. Is it sixteen? Two thousand and nine to mm. now is how many years? Fifteen. Mm. Mm. Right. Mm-hmm. Yes, we are actually thinking of um, doing one more. But mm. I'm not sure she would want to carry it. So, but we we'll have to have one. At least, you know what I mean. Mm. If we're planning sort of this. Definitely. Planning sort of this. I will need. We need one. Maybe before the, we we'll, we'll get that. The one you grow, that, The one you're going to grow. The one where, the, one where, uh, hey, <laughs> the first two are almost out. Mm. The, my daughter is. Uh, my daughter is um, going to be 19 in May, and mm. she's uh, in her third year in the university. Mm. And then her younger brother is also joining joining her there and this other one is right away so it will zoom me out so mm-hmm. we need to look get one that will look at look after us mm. uh, it, it's a girl so that's it we are planning that is in the pipeline okay so, so we have we'll agreed it with the, with the family so okay. agreed with my wife and agreed with my children so they're looking, they're looking forward to a younger one you hear the fact is more like a family you have a question yeah so okay. you don't hear the fact no go ahead I, I wonder what a beautiful lady will ask me. Okay, it's not in that area. Okay. Not in that area. Okay. Okay, Okay, there was this, um, was there a story behind your arrest? AFCC arresting you in 2013. Concerning some of our... How old were you? Where is that coming from? (laughs) It's It's a research. It's a research. My mind tells me that. No, it's a research. No, no, no. No, no, no. No, no, no. No, no, no. Yes. No, no, no. Yes. I would love to. It's not a hidden fact. Okay. It wasn't even once. Actually, I will say it this way. And permit me also to give you another adage. I hope you play Igbo. Yes, definitely. Catch me on record. Record it and then probably when you go home, ask other people that. Mm. You know, in the village, you know, there are some dance they do. Somebody brings out a knife from the shield. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. once you find yourself in public space, yeah. in the political office, public office, the 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 constitution and the makeup of our democracy is such that there are checks and balances, right? Mm-hmm. The anti-graft agencies, namely the EFCC and then ICPC, 
their job will not be complete if they don't inquire into your conduct as a public office and um, they don't necessarily they don't necessarily need to wait to be sure you've done something wrong before they invite you over or they arrest you as a commissioner for finance of this state whoa you're talking about once 2013 i was arrested by the efcc detained by the efcc five numbers five times icpc three times I'm, I was holding, a, 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 you know, an, um, an office. I was a commissioner for finance from two, June 2011 to December 2014. So, yes, I was arrested several times. You know, they cannot go for the governor. Mm -hmm. The governor has immunity. But he took his turn after he left office. He too was arrested. I'm sure you saw the drama. Yeah, they had to be yeah. scared of the beauty. Yeah, no. But they couldn't have done that while it was governor because governors enjoy immunity. Yeah. But so, but EFCC, ICPC had to do their job. So the next part of call is finance commissioner, accountant general, commissioner for this, commissioner for that. And you are under obligation to answer to them. Yes. yes. 2013 was one of the times. I think it was two times that year. And unfortunately for us, we were government in opposition. We came in through APGA. Mm. And then the central government was PDP. Mm. Right? And then from APGA, we also were joining APC. Mm. So we were making ourselves a lot more vulnerable. So yes, it's not a hidden fact. So you have to ask another hidden fact. This one is in the public domain. Mm. I recall one of, one, of the, one of the times I was, I was arrested. I spent um, one week and then I was released. I got back and then my governor, Richard Sokorocha, in his benevolence, said, you need to go outside the country. So he bought me a ticket and gave me money to go to do medical checks. I was on my way back. I was I was flying British Airways from London to, to Abuja. And then I found myself in business class compartment beside the then governor of Benue State, uh, Suzuan. And the national security advisor then, called Sambo, sincerely, who were in the same, the same environment in the business first class. So when I saw those big men, I said, okay, let me go introduce myself. You know, I mean, that's how you make, mm. that's how you make friends and get to know people. Incidentally, the governor sees one and the wife and their child were in the same aircraft. The son, I think he was a teenager then, he was sitting next to me. He, was, he wasn't feeling very well. So at some point he threw up. So I had to help. So in the process, you know, seven, six to seven hour flight. So you like the whole half or half a day. So you must get acquainted, right? So, ah, who is this? I said, my name is Chico Kava, Commissioner for Finance, Yemo State. Susan was like, hey, yeah, you are the EFCC. <laughs> because it was the previous week. You know, because the thing was in the news, it was everywhere. You know, so, yeah. It's not a hidden fact. I got arrested, but it's in the line of duty. Nothing on to what. And then, of course, eventually, I'm not sure after the investigations, they saw anything because I have never been tried. I've never been even charged to court on any of the matters. I, I, it was on the line of duty and they were doing their job and I love them for that. Most of them are now my friends. So even now in National Assembly House of Red, they can also invite me. I don't know whether they are watching this. So that's why I say they are doing their job mm -hmm. in the line of duty and I love them. <laughs> Maybe fat. Okay, yeah, yes. I was commissioner for finance and um, the road you have today from uh, some town, sorry, from Oluru roundabout, I don't know if you know where you're running about is. Mm -hmm. If you are coming from Bank Road, yes. where you meet, this is Abakoya, um, Warehouse, um, warehouse. warehouse Roundabout. Yes. That road on the left that takes you through Umezulike Hospital, mm -hmm. through straight to West End to Emmanuel College. That is the road that created the J-Pro saga. Okay, fine. So I, I wasn't commissioner for works. Mm -hmm. I wasn't commissioner, I was commissioner for finance. And uh, the job of the finance commissioner is to pay approvals from the governor, okay? And then, then of course, the Ministry of, Ministry of Works, in the case of the road, engages the contractors and then awards contract. Mm -hmm. My job at that of my accountant general is, oh, there's an approval from the governor to pay to so, so, so company mm -hmm. through Ministry of Works. Mm -hmm. You pay once there's money mm -hmm. and once the governor gives you the final, what to call, cash backing, mm -hmm. you pay. So Jepros, I don't know where he got that name from, but true, true, was, um, I think a man is from 
is a is a Lebanese contractor or Israeli contractor or something. Is mm -hmm. Oyibo, mm -hmm. complete Oyibo. Mm -hmm. I didn't know him, so I didn't even know the job he was doing. But what I knew was that I want to believe that the Ministry of Works had done what we call procurement process because there's a law, procurement act, that specifies how. Um, government money should be spent, how the awards should be advertised, long blah blah blah, the bidding process and all that and all that. That is not my job. It is the job of the awarding ministry, in this case, Ministry of Wars. So what I remember was that there was an approval from the governor to pay JPROS the amount you mentioned, one billion. So I didn't know what was the contract sum, and all that and all that. So we followed due process and then we paid. I didn't know the road. I didn't have to know the road. So a couple of weeks, months down the line, there was a problem. The governor called me. I'm talking about His Excellency Ola Narasha Sokorocha. Called me, I came to his office and he said, you pay J plus one billion naira. I mean, we pay money every day. So how was I to remember the particular one? But J plus, he struck me. I said, yes, we pay J plus one billion naira. So I'm not sure whether it's one billion, but I know there was an approval. He said, did I approve? I said, yes. There's no way we could have paid without approval. Say, today, today, you're finished. That's okay. He told you that. He was angry. A lot of things happened. Okay. He was angry. He was a man that wants to put in, make sure that every naira and every cobble has mm -hmm. a value for it. Mm -hmm. He is no longer the governor, but I'll tell you this I work with him. For every cobble that Russia Sokorocha is putting out there, he wants to see value for it. Mm. You may have issues with his own process and approach, mm -hmm. but as a man who served him as commissioner for finance, I will tell you that Richard Sokorocha was not given to dashing and doling out money. Mm -hmm. For every cover that he is giving to anybody, he wants to see value, so long as it is public money. Mm -hmm. As a private person, you, I'm sure you, you, you read a lot about his uh, philanthropy. Mm -hmm. To him, that was his personal money. Now that he's holding these resources of the state in trust, I will tell you that this, this was him. Mm. So, I I saw where the anger was coming from. He said, go and get me the document. I want to see where I approved. I took my phone and I called my accountant general. Because for every payment that we make, I have my copy of that approval. Mm -hmm. And the accountant general has his own copy of the approval. So, since he said I will not leave his office, the next person to call was my accountant general. I called him a, a fine chartered accountant, H.A. George, from, from uh, Ngopala. Fine accountant, chartered accountant. I called him. He said, I said, Where are you? He said he was close to his office. I said, Do you remember Jepros? Payment. He said, Yes. I said, Do you have a copy of approval? He said, Yes. I said, Fine. Bring it to Ogan's office. Of course, I don't know whether I'm schooling you. I need to t teach you how government process, how mm -hmm. it works. Governor does not sign his approvals, okay. it's conveyed to you by his principal secretary. The principal secretary to the governor was standing in that same office where the governor was telling me there was no approval. And I looked at the principal secretary. The principal secretary must have confirmed to him that there was no such uh, approval. So, but for me, who knew that there was nothing we were doing wrong? Ours was to take approvals. And once there's money, we we'll process and we we'll pay. Fine. So, in no time, my general walked in with his file. Can I see? I said, give me. My cousin gave it to me. Mm -hmm. I looked at it, I smiled. I took it to the governor. I said, sir, this is Jepros. He took it. He turned to the P P P PS. You signed it. You conveyed it. He said, sir, can I see? Can I see? He showed it. He looked at it. He said, ah. He said, that was how I was let off the hook, so to say. And my cousin was let off the governor was now saying, you, Principal Secretary, go and bring where I minuted to you before you conveyed. This was happening like three, four hours, so we were held hostage. Mm -hmm. I did not know that Director of SSS was waiting, Commission of Police was waiting in the next rooms mm -hmm. to arrest us if we didn't have proof mm -hmm. that we had his final approval. Mm -hmm. So the PS went, came and said, hey, brought the paper. I said, yes, okay. See where you minuted on the memo written to him by the Commissioner for Works. Mm -hmm. And he approved, and he, this man conveyed. I brought my general gave me, showed me where we also came back to the governor, where he finally gave what to call cash back and approval, and we paid. 
So we are let out the group. Now for work went wrong. We all started talking like a family. And I said to the governor that this money was not paid directly from Akaba General's office. It was funded to Ministry of Works. So they should come and tell us what happened. The rest is history. And um, one of the things that led to the impeachment in office of that gentleman from Emekuku, Jude Abaso, was this thing. I don't have the details. I'm not. That, mm. but that's one of the things that led to his impeachment from office was this j saga. Because eventually, long story short, uh, Joseph Dina, that's the man's name. Because I, and I found out that what had happened there was that the j Joseph Dina, had abandoned the site and ran, ran away with a lot of money. But somehow, my Carter General was supposed to be a guy in the streets. So he got back to me a couple of weeks down the line and said that that man sneaks in. Because I think he had a relationship somewhere, one of the, somewhere, somewhere. So he sneaks in to come and see his female friend or something and all that and all that. And one day I was in my office. My phone rang. Well, my Carter General, who traveled to Abuja over the weekend, was coming back He from Lagos. He called me and said, guess who is on the flight with him coming from Abuja? From Lagos to where I said, who? He said, Jepros. Because at that point, what had happened was that the man had absconded, so to say. Well, like I said, you know, streetwise, uh, if, if, you know, information was that he comes in once in a while and all that and all that. So, and there we were, my Katajara telling me that the man was on the same aircraft. And I knew he was a wanted person. So I personally arranged and went to the airport with some security. So as my Katajara was coming out from the Playing with the man, we had him to his car, but I'm wearing him. Tried to sneak into his car, we apprehended him. We took him from the airport and brought him to the government house. So he, he, now had his, he now had his time with the security and the rest. Mm -hmm. So that's where our own job stopped. So, yes, I've answered your question. It was a general <laughs> saga, but it's not one of the hidden facts. Okay. It was in the public domain and it created so much you know, political tension. Like I said, it was one of the things that actually led to the impeachment of the then deputy governor because he was also the commissioner for works. Okay. Deputy governor was serving as commissioner for works. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I believe that you were uh, a deacon because I know my brother was close to you. He is still close to you. Yeah. Um, you were a deacon at the, at the time. I am still. Yes. And why didn't you face that part of life? What was the defining moment? What made you go into politics? So, okay, yeah, what happened? The defining moment in my life was in um, 2011, I had become a senior management staff of Zenith Bank. I was sitting in that branch and um, I was doing my job. But I'll tell you this, that in this, I don't know how it is now because I have left, I've left banking since 2011. So that's like 13 years ago. So I don't know. So much more may have changed. But at the time then, uh, for someone who wants to succeed in banking, in this sort of environment, you would have to do so much with the government. Because government still remains then and now the biggest spender. Mm -hmm. So you cannot, you can't succeed as a banker or a bank with monies and businesses you get from commercial and retail people. You must have to have, to have the chunk of business from government and so that was my niche that was my strength over the years since i came into banking and i got transferred from port to away in 2001 so i was doing a lot of what we call public sector banking you know so that's so getting businesses of ministries departments and agencies of government and all that and all that so i was doing that a lot so by 2000, 2011 elections were coming I may shock you now that I had never registered to vote. The first time I registered to vote, and the first time I voted, was the election that I participated in in 2015, the one that brought me to National Assembly. So I had this apathy, I don't want to call it hatred. Where I lived in Aladem Mahia, Umaya Street, that's the primary school field, Aladem primary school, down the street where I lived. I go there to play football, start to play football. Then, and so one of the days I came out and I saw very old men and women who live in my estate filing out. And the question was, what are they doing? They said they are registering to vote. I laughed them to scorn. Say, oh, people find time to come and do registration. Does votes count in this country? As you say, they just, they just derive result and that's it. 
So that's the extent or the level of uh, myopathy to politics and the electoral process. That imagine, now you listening, so imagine that as a banker, I hated the idea of politics. I had never voted. So just imagine me working in a bank and then there was an election and then they say Abga won. Well, before the election, most of you here know the young man called Ugumbu Chewosu. Mm -hmm. He was two years my junior in the university. I'm trying to answer the question my defining moment. Then mm -hmm. I'll come to ask, answer why I had to leave. Mm -hmm. I didn't leave because I wanted to. My, I, I, I see myself as an accident in politics, but I love that accident. Mm -hmm. I love that accident. So, Uche Wonsu was two years my junior in the university, and we did student politics together. I was a senior. And then suddenly somebody showed up in my branch. I was coming in, a senior boy with my suit. Ah, Chike! I turned, there was a young man. I hardly recognized him. But he was wearing, you know, cloth mm. with Rocha's head all over. So that stood him out as a young guy who was mm. working for Rocha, who was running for governor. I said, one day, how far? Ah, yes, I don't look for you. I came here yesterday. They say, you know, they, I want to draw a check. He came to cash a check. I said, okay, follow me. I took him to my office on the last floor, put him in my office. And then, of course, someone that recognized me, someone that knew me from the university, he wasn't looking like a small boy. He was a big boy. So I had to give him big, big boy, you know, uh, treatment. So I called cashier, called, took my phone, my intercom, come here, process this check. Bring the money, give to my friend. And then he was paid. We exchanged numbers. He left. Two, three days later, he called me on phone. Ah, how do we do it? We did campaign for Uruaba. But I have this check. The account he was drawing from happens to be Richard Sokolota's company account from the bank, Zane Bank in Abuja. Are you listening? So he now called me on phone, of course. I said, okay, send somebody. So I'm sending my driver. So I sat down, but I said, sign the check for back. You know, do this, do that. The driver now came, I cashed the money, I gave the driver, and that was it. One week down the line, elections were concluded, and Russia as a culture won. What would what, what it consign me? Are you, are you, are you following? What it consign me? Then two days after he won, I got a phone call from the young man, Uche Wosu. And then I went to meet him in his hotel room, and he said, I'd like to take you to the governor elect. What for? I said, it took my pleasure. Because I'll need also to sustain business mm -hmm. in the next four years from the government. And then I met the, I met the government elect. And he said, Luce says, you are, his, you are such a nice guy. What's your level in Zenit? I told him, ah, Zenit is big. I'd like to see the managing director. Can you arrange it? I said, yes, sir. Which MD will not want to say governor elect? Mm -hmm. the talk. I said, yes, I will arrange it. And then, of course, we exchanged numbers, said, run it by Uche. Within a couple of days, I got through to my MD, the immediate past CBN governor, Godwin Amefeli. He was my group managing director. I was able to do it, went through my zona head and all that, and meeting was fixed in Abuja while they were still governor-elect. Meeting was fixed in Abuja, and then we went to Abuja for the meeting. And then, of course, we had put some proposals, you know, what we want to do with the government and all that. Of course, I mean, I'm, mm. I'm now looking at Opportunity. The then I'm going to be, we're going to be deputy general manager in the next one year. By the time I bring big, big business, mm -hmm. those businesses that were in UBA, that were in Fidelity Bank, I'm going to carry all of them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's my thought. You see, but I don't know what to say about this your program, but I like to put it out there. Don't forget the place of divinity in whatever you do. Mm -hmm. Make your plans, but God has the master plan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's a man that orchestrates our life. Is the unseen mover, the unseen hand. Don't ever neglect the place, his place in your life. Mm -hmm. So we got to the meeting. I had a proposal. I gave it my MD. MD studied it. He said, fantastic, fantastic. We'll give it to him. And then, of course, the meeting, he, we, were, we were waiting for him, for Roger Sokorocha's uh, aide, <coughs> to tell us where he is staying in um, the hotel. Because he just moved in, just came in from outside the country. My MD had flown in from um, Lagos, and they would put him in a suite there. So Uche also called me up to where they were having a meeting. Governor was having a meeting with other governors in the last floor of Hilton Transcorp. 
And I went there. Immediately he saw me. He said, ah, this is my bank man. <coughs> Maybe he's in town. I said, yes, sir. He's in this hotel. He said, yes, sir. So he wants to confirm where to meet you. He said, take me to his room. And then we got on the lift. I was now struggling to let my MD know. That my MD was waiting in his room. Sweet. You know, for me to come to say, and pick him. this is, yes, sir. Pick him and say, let's go. Now, there, there was the governor-elect saying, let's go and see him. I was struggling in the lift, struggling until I, Chike, how far? Okay, we're on our way to you. So fantastic. We got down to the fifth floor, went to the door. My, my MD, Mayfield God, we opened the door. We moved in with Governor Rosa Zokorocha, governor-elect, as it then was. We moved in. So, ah, MD, say, yes, let's say, congratulations. I didn't see you. You didn't give me support in the election. No. He said, don't worry, we'll give you support now that you're governor. He said, no, you have to start from now that governor elect. He said, whatever you want. So we sat down. He asked everybody else out except Uche Wosu and me. Everybody else, including go deputy governor elect who was in that entourage. So he asked everybody out, leaving me with uh, my friend Ogumbu Wosu. And then, then my MD started talking what we call marketing, trying to talk about the strength of the bank, you know, the, the, the focus of the bank and um, how the bank is going to align with his uh, programs and support him. He said, MD, hold it. Do you know why I, I, call, I call for this meeting? MD said, tell me, sir. I don't know what you want. I don't care about what you want. But I want you to release this young man to me to manage my finances. And anything you want, from the state, he will give you. Just like that. Hey, that's the turning point. Mm -hmm. So it was like, what was that? He got up. He said, MD, I'm done. My inauguration is on the 29th of May. I don't have money. He said, sir, leave it. He said, finance. Calling me finance. So talk with your MD. Get me money to do my inauguration. I caught up to leave it. He said, my friend, stay back. You're not working with me yet. You're working with MD. Not the ego for the inauguration. Yeah. Well, did I believe it? No. I didn't believe it. Because for me, I felt such plume political appointment can only be given to people who, who did quite a lot to support or help you win election. Finance commissioner, if you make me, make me governor of this state, I won't give it to anybody that I don't know. This man didn't know me. And then, of course, I wasn't part of his election. I wasn't, I did nothing to support him. I was not even, I didn't even vote for him. So that was a defining moment for me, right? And, um, well, did it come to pass? Yes. Two weeks down the line, Meli was inaugurated as governor. He named these are commissioners. I was number one. That's how I found myself, you know, holding political office. So that was that word you used, defining moment, right? Mm -hmm. So that was a def defining moment. You know, it wasn't easy moving away from organized banking environment where I wasn't just there, you know. You know, I was high up there, you know. Every every Monday you, you hold your visual meeting with your zonal, zonal and uh, executive directors. You hold your own local meeting with your marketing staff. You know, you do your reports and all that and all that. It was like some sanity, you know, I, I was saying. Then I found myself in the public sector. Then I was sworn in, I was thrown into Ministry of Finance, where the permanent secretary was as old as my father. I had directors, you know what it means? And I was barely 37 years, or 39. I was taught, I was taught 39. That young age, I found myself responsibility. Necessity was laid upon me. So it was it was a huge moment. It was a huge, you know, defining moment for me. I had to grapple with, you know, the 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 moving from one extreme of organized private sector to public life. And then in a couple of weeks, and they made me understand that you're the political leader of your local government. What did I know about politics? You know, but God has been faithful. Mm. From that moment. From that moment to now. So that's the defining moment for me. And then why did I have to move from the ordained minister in the church? I of course when the when the offer was made, the first person, apart from my family that I spoke to, was the first person, the next person was my pastor. I ran to my pastor. I said, see. He said, okay. My pastor said, okay, mm -hmm. I'll get back to you tomorrow or next. Of course, he had to pray over it. Mm -hmm. Two days later was Sunday. I came. 
He said, God said, go there. You're my ambassador. Go there. You're my disciple. Make sure that the God that is in you is not lost in that, in that, in that space. In that, in that um, space. And I'm able to say in the last couple of years, nothing about me as a Christian in me has been lost because I found myself in politics. No, 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 no. Politics has not changed me. Rather, I have changed the operations of politics around and about me. And that fact is known to everybody who work with me and my constituents. Those regular things people know that people do in politics, not with Chico Kafu. Do I drink? No. Do I serve it? No. You come to meeting in my house, you drink water, you drink coke, you drink malt. All right. So that's that's the defining moment. If I'm if I if I as I do well, and then why did I leave? I didn't leave. God sent me out. So and I'm still there. That's why I said to you when you asked a question about my routine. Mm-hmm. I said I come back every weekend. My family is here, and then I have a very defined role as an assistant pastor. I'm a pastoral assistant, pastoral assistant to my pastor, mm-hmm. Christ Embassy on the Char Road. So I have not left that assignment because that is the most important thing. The Bible says, seek it first. Kingdom of God and this righteousness and every other thing shall be added unto you. As a matter of fact, if Jesus studies, we will all come back to God mm. and to the work of the kingdom, one way or the other. Mm. If you don't do it alive, you do it in death. Because the church, the church, the church will not last last. Mm-hmm. I, we've had um, on social media, mm. you know, people say, a lot of things, and I, of course, I know you read a lot in social media. Are there rumors, things you feel that you know you want to debunk here today? Okay, so maybe the, maybe the, the last one we had to deal with a week mm. ago. I am very savvy, regular, two four seven on social media. Okay. In fact, if uh, sometime last week, I don't know what happened to Facebook and Twitter. I woke mm. up and I discovered that I was shut down. For the first time in so many years, I felt that I, was, I wasn't on this planet Earth. Mm. I said that to say that that is nothing, nothing gives me some bit of security, like being updated on events and around, in, in and around the world on social media. So, yeah. Last week, I woke up and I saw some trending video from some guy from some, one of the government areas in my constituency talking about Okay, governor just released the first list of commissioners, mm. 12 of them. And of course, we have more than 20 ministries. A governor puts out the first set of his appointments. And then some people who served in his first tenure from my constituency started feeling jittery. As if they have been excluded from the government and all that and all that. So some guy put out some video and then alleged that I was responsible for um, some guy in YouTube and not being appointed as commissioner who had served in the first first term. And I didn't quite like that. And then that after that, having stopped that that person and then some other person from my from the OPO, having stopped them from being reappointed, that I was now going to mobilize to remove the current serving speaker of the Imo House of Assembly. I'm sure most people must have read that. I felt that was usually I'm not one to want to react things out there because some very wrong narratives have been put out about me in the past and my training my understanding is that bad news doesn't last more than 72 hours mm-hmm. that's my, my my understanding and i haven't been proved wrong so but this one is weighty so i had to debunk it i had to put it out to say why are you saying that oh, these are these are these are these persons who were not pre appointed i was responsible the governor of the state, the single state of hope, or they can also mm. is completely in charge of the state, completely in charge of the government. And he has not left anybody in doubt. You know, you can be in charge, but you want people to think that you're not in charge. Not in this case. Is this NLC, Senator Hope Ozodema is in charge, and he leaves nobody in doubt that he's in charge. The appointment of people to his office or to offices in the government is his prerogative. And he's been exercising it. So why would you now be responsible for those who thought they ought to be reappointed and they were not appointed, reappointed? So how to debunk it? And then how would you now say that I was going to move against a sitting speaker? Chikulebu is like a younger brother to me. And we worked very closely during the campaigns. 
And it was difficult for some people in that local government area where he comes from to even embrace and accept his candidature. I went around the 23 communities of the local government area and I sold him and I told him he would be speaker prophetically. And since he became speaker, he has always given me my respect. The fact that he is a number three citizen notwithstanding. If I call him that I want to see him, I want to say, no, so you shall not again, he will come. So he gives me my respect. Why would you now allege that I was also plotting to remove him from office? Meanwhile, the office is holding, he's holding it at the mess. Okay, well, the other 26 members of the House of Assembly elected him unanimously. And they're the ones that will remove him if they want to. And I'm not in that house. I'm not a member of that house. And it is not possible for me, an outsider, even if I don't like Chike Olimwe, it's not possible for me, who is a federal lawmaker, to have any influence to have him removed. So, yes, I have to debunk it in writing from my office, and I'm debunking it here publicly that the appointment to of commissioners and other positions are the are the prerogative and responsibility of the governor of the state. He says it's the man. And I doubt if he consults anybody why doing that. Even if he does, it's a privilege that he has given to you if he consults you before he makes any appointment. Otherwise, constitutionally, is his prerogative and is his um, is his uh, responsibility. And he, he has not left anybody in doubt that he's completely in charge and in control of government. So I'm not responsible for those people who felt they ought to be appointed or reappointed and they were not reappointed. And there is no such thing about any attempt by me or anybody to move against the current uh, very humble, responsible and responsive Speaker of the Ibo House of Assembly. So. Thank you so much. Um, lastly, I would want to ask, what is your next move in impacting lives? You have something extraordinary from what you have been doing, something new that you want to do. If in fact would like to be the first to. Okay, yeah. So apart from my um, current uh, running health program and um, uh, my, ed my ed 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 educational support, and also um, the efforts we have made in the co last couple of years to have people gain employment, paid employment. Um, we want to now go into skill acquisition. Okay. We're talking with NDE, the Nigerian um, National Director of Employment. We're talking to mm -hmm. ITF, um, the Industrial Training Fund. Mm -hmm. We're also talking to USAID, some of these international agencies, because mm -hmm. my position as Chairman Committee on Health, um, Committee on Nutrition and Food Security gives me some leverage you know um a lot of these uh, um, development partners like uh, the world bank like the unicef like the usaid mm -hmm. like in the in, in, in international are all interested in any and everything that will help to make life better yeah. and affordable mm -hmm. so in the last couple of couple of weeks we've been meeting and um, they are going to collaborate with me to identify some young men and women who want to go into farming so we can help them set up different farms. We're looking to do that between now and June and then skill acquisition also. So that's what I have. I haven't even announced it, so you're the first to know. Okay. So this studio is the first place I'm announcing that and um, we've, already, we've already identified quite a number of them and we're pulling them together because I believe that just like the Chinese proverb, you know, give one fish to eat and he'll eat it only once. But teach him how to fish and, and he will eat fish for the for, forever. So that's the, the next line of action. And um, God will help me to make it mm -hmm. huge. I have three, three teenage children. Nin 19 is teenager. Yeah. Uh, 14 is, 14 yes. is teen. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have three teen, teenage children, two boys and a girl. Um, so far, so good. I and I, I will give kudos to my wife because she's actually their first point of call. You know, right from when I got married to her, I was like I said, I was a banker. I had my three kids while I was still in banking, so I had um, I hardly ha I, I didn't have so much time with, with them. But like I said, life is about priority, and then what was the last word I also used? Um, yeah, priority, and then setting the right you know, making the right decisions. So somewhere along the line, I discovered and I found out that I had the responsibility to be in the life of my children, all right? So um, the biggest challenge was when they were younger and I hadn't had this understanding I have now, 
that you must have to deliberately. It's called it's called um, um, intentional parenting. Intentional parenting. You have to intentionally. There's a difference between a dad and a father. Yeah. Hmm? Dad, father. Anybody can get a woman pregnant. But it takes a father. Even if you don't have to have got a woman pregnant. There are so many of us here who have children, but you are, they are not you didn't father them mm -hmm. as in biologically, right? Mm -hmm. So so you have to make parenting intentional. So what I have done is to make out time, even when I'm not around, like once I leave Abuja tomorrow, there is no day I don't speak to my my family on on video. We pray on phone. My daughter is in Abuja because she's doing her IT. She left I left her last week. And then this morning, I have had to call her, daughter, I'm not coming back again today. So, daddy, but I made fried rice. I cooked this, I cooked that. I said, do the calls. But I'll be there first thing tomorrow morning. Okay, daddy. Yeah, so you have to make it conscious. You have to, you have to, you have, you have to be intentional about it. The challenge, oh, yeah. <sighs> yeah, not always been there. I mean, I wish I don't have things that take me away. I wish I, I'm two, four, seven with them. Because I also come back and I see gaps, you know, and then I I have to struggle, you know, to do the extra to That's fill all. to fill the gaps. Let me share this. Something happened yesterday. Some guy who makes clothes for me, maybe I haven't called him in the last two years. So he woke up and then maybe he started seeing me wearing some new designs, like what I'm wearing, you know. So and then maybe he was wondering who. Uh, who could be making that for Yishi? So he went and then made quite a number, about four, five or six, and brought them. He didn't even see me. I was off to church. He dropped them. So when I got back, they said, Obed came. So I took the clothes. I dropped it on the table, on the bed. My wife takes care of what I wear. She said, hey, but daddy, this one, this one. You can't wear this. You can't wear this. That we should return it to him. I said, I can't return to him. Returning to him means I'm not going to pay for that. That's a young, a struggling young man. I said, I'm going to return it to them. I called my two sons. They are taller than me. I called them. I said, Chiwameka. No, I called my first one first. He came in and I said, try this. He took it, closed the door, undressed himself before me, wore it. You know, daddy, I'll just have to amend the waist. But that's not a problem, dad. I said, yes. Maybe he was thinking I was going to say, leave it. Do you understand? I said, I said, and then I'll, I'll just the waste, but I'll get, I'll get it amended. I said, fine, but you like it? He said, he likes it. He left the room. I was dressing up to go for some outing. The outing you saw me, okay, right? Mm. So, so the younger brother walks in. That's the way my kids behave. They are very close, but they don't want to make me think that they are close. Mm. So the second one walks into the room immediately. Daddy, you're, you're, you're going to somewhere? I said, yes. He walked like this. I said, what do you want? He said, nothing. He said, did you see the clothes I gave to America? He said, yes. Are you understanding now? Now, the elder brother came out and showed him the clothes. And then he walks through the door. I said, do you have any for me? Not like if I say no, that would be a problem. So he was now moving around. I said, you, you want to say something? He said, no. And I asked, did you see the clothes I gave to America? He said, yes. Do you have any for me? I said, that's what you came to do. Why not tell me? Hey, I tried this one. He tried it and he wore it. And then I called him. I said, go to my shoe, shoe rack. I see whether you can get shoes. They wear the same size with me. Whether you can get shoes to match the clothes. And they did. Their mother was not there. She went for an outing. So when she now met me in that event, mm -hmm. she said, you created so much joy in the house. I said, what happened? She said, your boys are happy. You, you know, you gave them clothes and you gave them shoes. All right? So I said that to say that any little time I have around them, I try to create memories. So, because I'm not always around. So the challenge is that I wish I am a lot more available. That's the challenge. You know, but man has to walk. Mm -hmm. And they understand that. So, but once I'm around, once I am around, I do everything humanly possible to fill the yearning gap my absence creates. Parenting has been very exciting and I'm happy and I thank God for my wife. You know, because she's uh, the one actually that is molding their spiritual life. Because I'm hardly available to do that. And my kids are turning out well. I thank God for that. 
You see, because <laughs> people get it wrong. People get it very wrong when they talk about financial. Well, I'm a finance expert. I read economics. I studied banking and finance. I have degrees up to PhD. We talk about economics and finance and human resources. But I have also d gone deep working with God. And I'll tell you that you have to strike a balance. I am not in, I'm not in the mode of people that will tell you that God will give you money. No. Because he says, I will bless the work of your hand. There's nothing like miracle money. God can only bless you from what you do. Somewhere in the book of Ecclesiastes, he says, who, he, who does not walk, let him not eat. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Fine. So everything dovetails to you have to have a means of livelihood. It could be your skill. It could be a profession. It could be something you do that puts money in your hand. So the first principle is have a means of livelihood. Don't be slothful. Don't be idle. That is it. Mm. Then, if it is possible, have multiple sources of income. If it is possible. Mm. No matter how small it is. Make sure you don't have one source of income. The COVID era showed, taught so, the world so much. The COVID. Mm. The whole economy of the world crumbled. But people were looking for food and medicine. I don't know if I'm saying. Everything in the world shut down. But people were looking for food. And people were looking for medication. So what, what did that teach me? Even the school that I started, I felt, oh, as a banker, banks were always in a hurry to rush to, to learn to school. Learn to schools. Schools were shut down for months, if not up to one year, because of the COVID restrictions. Mm -hmm. And then... A lot of those schools had borrowed money from banks. Banks funded them, am I right? Post-COVID era, banks have to restructure the facilities because the schools were no longer repaying because nobody was going to school, so nobody was paying school fees. But in the midst of the COVID and the shutdown and the lockdown, people were looking for food to eat. And then when they are sick, they look for medication, am I right? So mm -hmm. you know what that taught me? For whatever you want to do, if you want to be stable, in making money, look for look for a way to farm. Look for a way to farm. Even if it's for subsistence farming, because people must eat. If you have a little more money, then set up a kiosk, sell drugs. These two things, mm -hmm. COVID taught me that even clothing is no longer as important. People were staying indoors. Not when you want to come out, you go change clothes. People were so those who were making clothing, uh, the basic basic necessities of life, uh, shelter, food, uh, clothing, clothing. Nobody cared about clothing. You stay inside your house. Where you the dress go? But somehow you must find a way and go and look for food. The food you are going to get to eat. Who was making it? Somebody had, somebody was making it somewhere. Governments all over the world were finding a way and supporting farmers because they must produce food. People must eat. Ditto for the medi medication. So to answer you, you must have something to do. All right? You must have a means of livelihood. You must have a skill. Develop a skill. Put it out. When you put it out, people will come looking for you. There's a young man, well, because I go preaching, I preach, I go for ministrations. There's a young man, I had a butter cut. He was the best in video, what do you call it? Video class. I don't know what you call it, but he, mm. he covers my events for years. As I am ministering, he covers. As he's going back to Port Harcourt, hmm, the next one hour, he's sending me clips from my ministration. I found him, I found that young man um, indispensable. But somehow he got a job. Before the last World Cup in South Korea, is it Korea? The, 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 this World Cup. Where was the last, the other World Cup? Korea, Japan. Or oh, Qatar. Yeah. Qatar. He got a job with some company took him, you know, video and all that and all that. He didn't come back. I have not been able to find a replacement. I have tried four or five hands. Sincerely, I've tried four or five hands. As in, follow me to my ministration. In fact, the last one I used, January, I did ministration. He has not even sent me a clip. <laughs> I didn't know what I'm saying. He has not even sent me a clip. So what am I trying to say? That guy, 
out there. If I find myself in a position where I can pay him twice what he's earning there, I'll bring him back because of the skill. So I say that to say, develop a skill. Make yourself indispensable that nobody else can do it the way you do it. All right? It can be a craft, right? But make sure you have something that you do and from where you earn a living. If you end up with a paid job, salary cannot make you rich. Salary is a level of human beings. But if you want to operate at the level where we operate, you have to be a spirit being. Finally, whatever it is, whether it's skill, whether it's job, whether it's this anchor on God. Mm. Because it's not of him that will it. It's not of him that run it. It's the Lord that showed mercy. The battle is not to the strong. The race is not to the swift. Time and chance happen it. And it is God that causes it to happen. So that is it. Thank you so much. I think uh, this brings us to the final segment of uh, this particular um, edition. Thank you very much, uh, our viewers. Uh, thank you for watching. Thank you for the time. And thank you for taking your time to watch through this uh, quite insightful um, segment of uh, Hidden Fact. Thank you. I wish you stay tuned for more episodes.